Looking out to sea today, it's hard to imagine that less than 100 years ago, huge sailing ships were still plying the oceans and offering viable competition to the steamships, both in terms of their speed and their running costs. One such ship, the Duchess, the Herzogin Cecily, was a four-masted bark that was sailing the great grain routes from the Southern Hemisphere to Europe. On the 24th of April, 1936, the Duchess set sail from Falmouth, bound for Ipswich. But thanks to the rocks you see behind me, this voyage was to be her last. The Herzogin Cecily had been built in 1902 in Bremerhaven, Germany. She was named after the German Crown Princess Duchess Cecily of Mecklenburg-Schwerin and had a length of 310 feet, around 100 metres, with a gross tonnage of 3,242. She carried 45,000 square feet of canvas across 35 sails. That's over an acre of sailcloth. She had a varied career, being used as a sail training ship before World War I, before being interned in Chile and given to France in reparation in 1920, then sold to Gustav Eriksson of Finland for £4,250 to become the flagship of his grain fleet, which eventually grew to be the largest fleet of sailing ships in the world. These great grain ships were fast. In fact, the Duchess could manage 21 knots, a respectable speed even today. The main advantage, however, was that it didn't cost much to keep her tied up in port. Loading grain could take up to six weeks at a time, and keeping a steamship tied up in port for that length of time was simply uneconomical. And grain was her cargo in January 1936, when she left Port Lincoln in Australia with 4,295 tonnes of wheat in 52,500 sacks. The Duchess made good passage to Falmouth via Cape Horn, arriving in just 86 days, a day ahead of her nearest rival. That meant Captain Ericsson could ensure her cargo of wheat would reach the market sooner than any of her competitors, assuring a higher price. She'd won the grain race no fewer than eight times before 1936, making the Duchess one of the largest, fastest grain ships of her time. On the 24th of April, her captain, a distant relative of her owner called Sven Ericsson, received his orders to set sail for Ipswich. She weighed anchor from the Carrick Roads at 8.20 that evening, with a crew of 23 Finns, four Danes, plus the captain and his wife Pamela, as well as a passenger, Diana Firth. With a fair wind and light fog, she headed south into the English Channel, then plotted a course eastbound to take her safely around Start Point. By 3.50 a.m., the fog was thick and events were unfolding very quickly. Here's a snippet from Falmouth for Orders by Alan Villiers. The mate suddenly saw a dark mass of land reach out from the murk to port. Within moments she had struck, despite urgent efforts to alter seawards. A steel ship of over 3,000 tonnes, full of 4,000 tonnes of wheat, hits rocks hard. She swung off, gravely damaged. Her two great anchors were let go, but they could not hold. She swung round, out of control, driving with sternway in the heavy swell, always toward the point of further danger. She took the ground again, pivoted on a pinnacle of rock, swung broadside to the sea and stuck hard and fast less than 50 yards from the 300 feet cliff that is the west face of Bolt Head, a full place for a good ship to find herself at any time. Within moments of the watch spotting land where there shouldn't be land, both watches were on deck, furling the sails and dropping both anchors into the sea in an attempt to check the ship's progress. But they were too late. The Duchess had hit the hamstone in Sewer Mill Cove here in South Devon. As the great grain ship drifted helplessly towards Bolt Head, the crew were on deck, setting off flares into the darkness. At this time, there were several Coast Guard stations along this section of coast, already a graveyard of countless wrecked ships. The Greystone Coast Guard lookout near Hope Cove to the west spotted the flares and rang the Steeple Cove lookout the other side of the ship towards Bolt Head. The Steeple Cove lookout duly phoned the Bolt Head Coast Guard station, but the duty Coast Guard had forgotten to connect the phone to the alarm and was sound asleep. So the Steeple Cove Coast Guard phoned nearby Higher Sewer Farm. The phone was answered by 16-year-old farmer's daughter Betty Smales, who ran through the night to the Bolt Head Coast Guard station. Meanwhile, one account tells of a young Danish crew member volunteering to swim ashore to raise the alarm. Having swum through the surf and clambered across the sharp, rocky foreshore, he found the cliff to be unscalable. 
Incredibly, he managed to swim safely back to the ship and clambered back aboard, soaked through and freezing. Whatever the truth of the Danish deckhand, by this time Betty Smales had raised the alarm with the Bolt Head Coast Guard and the Sulcombe lifeboat was launched at 4.30am. Being a motor lifeboat, it was on scene at 5am and the crew were astonished to see a fully rigged sailing ship before them between the Hamstone and Sewermill Cove. By 8am, the lifeboat had evacuated 21 of the crew and the passenger, Diana Firth. Then, by the afternoon, the Coast Guard had set up a breeches buoy and settled down on the cliff for a wet night under tarpaulin, whilst the captain, his wife and six of the crew remained on board. So, Roger, what caused the ship to go off course? Uh, well, when the Hurston and Cecily um, sailed from Falmouth in the early hours of April 25th, um, she was sailing in thick fog. And when she hit the Hamstone, um, just off Sawmill Cove, at 3.50 in the morning, she was 10 miles off her intended course. And there are a number of theories um, as to why she was so far off course. At the time, it was claimed by the captain that um, the compass had been uh, interfered with by magnetism from the iron in the cliffs, but that theory largely discounted. It was probably due to a combination of thick fog and insufficient allowance made when they were charting the course for the leeway, which uh, the tidal drift, which sort of set the, um, the ship uh, further inland, further north than they'd intended. They probably didn't make enough allowance for that. Um, so a combination of thick fog and probably navi navigational errors was the, were the main reasons. The following day, Sunday, April 26th, 1936, saw a sight unlike anything seen at the sleepy hamlet of Saw before. Not just the wreck of a giant windjammer, but thousands upon thousands of visitors who had flocked to the scene from Plymouth and further away. It said that 4,000 cars were parked at the head of Sewer Mill Lane, causing traffic chaos. Three seagoing tugs arrived, but salvage wasn't attempted. And why did the ship receive so much attention? In the years between the wars, the annual grain race between Australia and England attracted huge media attention. It was, everybody went to the pictures in those days and they would have seen the Pathé News and Movitone News and it would have um, um, bulletins on the progress of the race. And so it really fired the public imagination. And so when the, it was wrecked, thousands of people came to see. So it was the fourth time she'd won the race. Um, she was um, the fastest, uh, the largest of the old wind jammers. She had no engines, just relied entirely on wind, and she won the race in 86 days, seven days ahead of her nearest rival. The ship's cargo holds had been breached, and over the next day the cargo of grain started to swell. This was to prove the great ship's undoing. Over the next days, several hundred tonnes of the ship's wet and dry cargo was removed by lighters, but it took nearly two months before the stricken ship could be dragged free. She was towed to the sandy seabed of Stairhole Bay, just off Sulcombe Bar, and plans were made to refloat her. Visitors were charged one and sixpence to visit the ship via a rickety rope bridge that was rigged between ship and shore. Efforts to remove the grain continued, but the cargo, the grain, was rotting, and it was really only fit to be used as pig food or thrown to the crabs. Even Captain Ericsson was overcome by the fumes emitting from the grain, but luckily he was saved. It took just 86 days to sail from Australia to Falmouth. But 86 days after leaving Falmouth, the combination of gale force winds and the weight of her rotting cargo forced the Duchess 12 feet down into the sands behind me, where she broke her back on the underlying metamorphic rocks. Even 20 years ago, you could make out the outline of the wreck from the top of the cliffs here. But little now remains of the last great grain ship. The captain's cabin was preserved and can now be seen at Åland Maritime Museum at Mariham, Finland. Closer to home, the Cottage Hotel in Hope Cove has a cabin made from the timbers of the wreck. To visit the Hamstone, it's a beautiful walk from Bulbury Car Park or down the valley from the Sawmill Cove Hotel. The final wreck site at Stairhole Bay can be walked to from Overbeck's near South Sands or the East Saw Car Park. Refreshments are available at the East Saw Walker's Hut. Overbeck's and the Sawmill Cove Hotel. Don't forget to visit the fantastic Sulcombe Maritime Museum for much more local maritime heritage. A full account of the wreck of the Herzogin Cecily is available on their website. 
I'm Abby Gray, an archaeologist and historian who was born, raised and now works in Devon. Together with my producer Dave, we want to bring Devon's history and folklore to life for you and viewers around the world to enjoy. From the earliest Iron Age hill forts up to the Second World War and beyond. But we really need your support to help us do this. Every extra person that subscribes to our channel and likes our content helps us increase our potential for making more videos. So if you want to help us shape the documentaries that we want to make, please do support us on Patreon. The link is in the description. Thank you.